at the beginning. Um, the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness. There he was out in the wilderness, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. And Satan came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, look at your circumstances. You're hungry. There's nothing wrong with eating. Take these stones and make them bread. And it, literally what we found out was that uh, uh, what he was asking Jesus to do was to take charge. He was asking Jesus, trust in yourself, provide for yourself, do for yourself. Whatever you think is right, whatever you think you want, you can do it, so just go ahead and do it. And, and literally what he was trying to do was trying to get Jesus not to trust in the providence of God. That word providence is a word that means that God will guide us, that God loves us, that God will care for us, that God will take care of us and do it all the time. And we look at our circumstances, and we may not like our circumstances, and we may blame God for it. But we must always know that God loves us, and He cares for us. Now, let me also say this. Don't get me wrong. It is not wrong to work. We are created for work. And, and if you're one of those that doesn't think you uh, need to work, understand the Bible says if you're not going to work, you're not going to eat. It's up to you. It's your responsibility to do, to do that, not to let somebody else try to do it for you. But he said, even in that, you're given the, the help to do that and, and find the thing that you love to do and go do it you know, and work. Amen? But he says, understand that God is watching. God promised to take care for us, and God will always be enough. I like what Paul said. He said, I've learned in whatever state I am, therein to be content. So Jesus' answer to that temptation was, <clears throat> everything of this world is temporary. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God made promises to us. God will take care of us every step of the way. So now let's look at this next temptation that's coming up. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 4, stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. We'll in verse number 5, Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, and lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to them, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord, your God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the opportunity to come together with uh, my family here at New Holland, Lord, and to worship you. And Lord, I know that you are right where you need to be, on the throne. You watch over us. Jesus, I know you have prayed for our day. You pray blessings and good over us. The plans that you have for us are to prosper us and to help us. And God, you have not allowed anything that, that we will face today. You have, it, it's come through your will first. So we will not face anything that you haven't first faced and that you've not okayed. And Lord, no temptation, no temptation is, will come upon us or has come upon us except such as is common to man. And Lord, you'll may, make with it a way of escape. Lord, you don't want us to fall, but Lord, we do fall from time to time, and you doesn't change how you love us. You care for us, and you want better for us. And Lord, that verse that means so very much that I may know you, and Lord, also the power of your resurrection, that I put no false limitations upon you. Lord, that I may not see you through my perception, but I will see you in spirit and in truth. And Father, in the next few moments, by your Holy Spirit, we pray that you will draw us to yourself, that you will speak to us personally, and move us from where we are into the blessedness of your truth. We love you for doing that, and we ask you to do it again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. So Satan took Jesus from the wilderness. There 
he took him to Jerusalem. And he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. Jerusalem, that extremely important city. Of all the places for, for the, the Lord to make really the, his center, Jerusalem was that city. Jerusalem is still a very important city today. As a matter of fact, you might see it in the news. There's a lot of things that are happening in Israel today and in the lands that are around it, and it's all centered on that place. The people that God said he wanted to be his people, the Jewish people, they were the ones to, to, to be the witness to the world, but they turned their back upon God's Messiah, God's Christ, and they literally crucified him on a hill just outside that city of Jerusalem. And there's another group in Jerusalem today. It's the worship of those who follow that Messiah, who died for our sins on that cross. And as he rose from the dead to give new life, we know that he comes to give new life for us too. He was the fulfillment of everything that the Jews were blind about. Christianity is what we call it today. But there's also another group in Jerusalem today who have their own scripture, who have their own Christ, their own Lord, their own Messiah, and all three are there based in that place. And what was meant to be a place of peace is anything but peace today. And they can have this piece of cord and that piece of cord, but Jesus said there will always be wars and rumors of wars. I think what Jimmy Carter did was a great thing back in the late 70s, trying to broker some time of peace still, but we know that there's only going to be one peace agent, and that's Jesus Christ when he comes back again. But he took him to that place because Jerusalem was the place where they would build the temple where the Holy of Holies would be, which in the Old Testament, before the temple was built, was called the tabernacle. It was a tent. Now, how can a God who created the universe be limited to one place? He's not. But it was a symbol. It was a symbol to everyone. <clears throat> so when the children of Israel traveled, they would take the tent of the tabernacle with them. And the Lord would lead them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when God stopped, they stopped. And when they would set up the temple, and the Bible says, and the glory of God would come down and be in that place, that place showing the presence of God. And that's what Jerusalem was to represent. It was kind of a home base, so to speak. So Satan takes him there and takes him up to the pinnacle to look at all of it, hopefully where he was thinking that Jesus would feel comfortable and see all of that that had been made for the worship of him. And he said, once again, if you are the Son of God, and he's very cunning here, he says, throw yourself down, for it is written, the angels will protect you and gird you up. And nothing will happen to you there. Take your Bible and turn to in it to the Old Testament, to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Now, isn't it funny that Jesus ended the first temptation by saying, man does not live by bread alone, the things of this world, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, the promises of God, the providential care that God loves us. So Satan tries to take those same words and use it against him. Oh, you're going to trust in the Word of God? Well, let me read you a little of the Word of God. Let me read you the whole chapter. Is that all right? Begin with me in verse 1 of Psalms 91. I love Psalms 91. It's one of the most glorious chapters in all of God's words. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I just want to pause right there and say amen. Everywhere I go, everything I do, every circumstance I face, every hardship, every difficulty, I'm still in the shadow of the Almighty. This is a chapter about the providence, the guiding care, the power of Almighty God. Look in verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. To that we say amen, right? 
Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the errors that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. We need to look at our circumstances through the lens of the Word of God. We need to understand that God cares for us. God loves us. And Almighty God can take care of us and provide for us. Right? Remember what Paul said? I have learned in whatever state I am, therein to be content. He was saying, in, in the good times, I'll praise his name. In the bad times, I'll do the same. He is saying, in any circumstance, God is still on the throne. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look. And see the reward of the wicked. He said, I'll take care of the wicked when they do evil things. Psalms 37, verse 9. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. You've made the Lord in this high and lofty place your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Now here... Satan steps in very sneakily. And in this psalm of the providence and the care and the love of God, where the promises of God are quoted, Satan quotes them to lure Jesus astray. Look what he says in verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands... They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You know what he's saying? He took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and he says, look at all of this. This is the splendor. This is where God meets up. And Scripture says, Scripture says that if anything happens to you, he will take care of you. He will provide you. You, you will never have anything come against you. So here, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And Jesus answers back and says this. He says, it is written all, again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan's saying, you're God. If you are, if you're God, throw yourself down. The angels will come and take care of you. By the way, if he had, listen to me now. They would have, right? But what he is saying is, Satan's saying, prove it. Prove you that you're the Son of God. Jesus says, I don't have to prove anything to you. I am the Son of God. By the way, don't tempt the Lord your God. Don't say, God, you have to do this. Can, can I just... Uh, I left this out in the first service, so I don't want to leave it out again. Are you still in Psalms 91? Look at verse 13. Satan took verse 11 and 12 and just kind of gleaned them out. But look at the next verse, verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion, and the serpent you shall trample under foot. Hey, Satan, I love that. And at the right time, that's exactly what he did. But he looked at Satan from that place and says, I don't have to prove anything to you. I am the Lord. Don't tempt the Lord God. Don't tempt. Let, take your Bible. Go back to Matthew. I'm sorry to make you flip-flop, but take, go back to Matthew, and, and you can put your finger in chapter 4 if you want to, but look over in chapter 12. Matthew chapter number 12. I just love the Word of God. Matthew 12, look in verse number 
38. Are you there? Say amen. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Teacher, show us that you're God. Make it visible. Show me some great sign that says that you're the Son of God. Verse 39. He answered and said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. He says, an evil and an adulterous generation wants God to have to prove himself over and over and over again. Take your Bible and look in Matthew 16. Let's look in verse 1 this time. Once again, it says, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and testing him. Did you get that? Ask him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Okay, if you're the son of God, show us some great and a magnificent sign. You remember when Jesus was taken and Pilate was there? And Pilate heard that, that he was from Galilee, so he sent him to Herod. And Herod saw him. What was the phrase there? Because he wanted to see Jesus do some great sign. Remember that? Jesus never said a word, never did a thing, because Herod was looking for a sign. The Pharisees and the scribes, they come back again looking for a sign. Look what it says in verse 2. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. The evening when we see the sunset, my goodness, doesn't look beautiful, and you know it's going to be a nice, peaceful night, because the sky is red. Amen? But then it says, and in the morning... You say, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Listen to Jesus' words. Hypocrite, he says. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. I'm going to say that again. A wicked and adulterous. That means Adulterer is one who's married to another, but turns their back upon that bond and goes seeking after another. You say that you love God, but you're leaving that to go look for another. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after a son, and no son shall be given to it except the son of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus said, no sign, no sign will be given. They said, how do we know? How do we know? Please give me your attention for the next minute. In your life, probably from the time that you were very young, things began to happen to you, and Probably when you were very young, you didn't even understand fully what was happening. But a voice or an intuition or a leadership in some way began to come and point you to something that was greater than you, something that was there. He began to show that there is a God and that you could trust Him. For me, first grade. So I was seven, six or seven. I don't know how old I was. I, don't know. I was first grade. I remember that. And that was the first time that I remember God speaking to me. Listen, God is my witness. I believe that Satan began to try to move me away to do something dangerous to myself in the first grade. And I remember God saying, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm there for you. I will protect you. First grade. There are things that are happening in life, and if you'll just pause and open them up, you'll see that God has always been there. 
people who don't even know God. I was first grade. I lived in a house of Christians, but I didn't know God. I was not a Christian until I was 10. Doesn't matter. God will come. Romans chapter 1 says he'll, no, all nature, all the world is beyond excuse. God will come and make himself known. The question begins with will we stop, pause, and see the glory of God? Because it's everywhere. Now, Jesus, at this time, he had just been baptized by John the Baptist. It is the very beginning of his ministry. But he would go on to do some really amazing and magnificent things in his ministry. I I remember the time when he was going there with his family, and and he had some of his disciples with him. And and they went to a a wedding in Cana. And he's minding his own business, and, and they ran out of wine, and his mama said, Help him out. She sent the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. He's looking at her like, woman, who says it's my time? Don't you know she gave him that mama look? Amen? Do y'all mamas know what I'm talking about? Us children do. We remember that mama look. And Jesus told the servants, just go put water into those jars. H2O. Just go fill them up. And they did. Serve it. What's going through their mind? I'm about to get in trouble, but I'm going to blame him because he told me to do it. And they served. And what happened? What came? What went into that jar? Water. What came out of that jar? The people said the best wine that they'd ever drank. I wonder what those guys, those servants did when they did that. They poured in water. It came out wine. When they... They probably had a sneaking suspicion when it came out red. Amen? You think a glory bump went up there? They think they... Something began to go in their heart. And God in heaven's like, I knew exactly what I was doing. You remember when they went to Peter's mother-in-law's house? They went in the house and she had a sick with a fever and he just went and touched her and says, come on, woman, get up. And she got up, the fever left her and she started cooking. And everybody in the house went, wow, he can speak to a fever. Remember the time when the centurion, a Roman soldier over a group of a hundred soldiers and he had a servant who was sick, and he came to Jesus, and he said, I have a servant that's laying at the point of death. Uh, and, and Jesus says, I'll come with you. And he says, no, 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 no. I, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Just speak the word, for I am a man under authority as you are. And I say, go, and he goes, and I say, come, and he comes, and I say, do this, and he does this. And Jesus said, I've never seen such great authority. I've never seen such great faith, excuse me. And the the centurion leaves and finds out that that his servant was healed at that time. What about the Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus asking for her child's help? And Jesus said, no. And she said, it's not, he said, it's not good to take the food from the, the children and give it to the dogs. And she said, yes, but the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. Just give us a crumb, Lord. He said, your faith, your faith has done this. And she went home and found her child healed from that moment. Do you think God was trying to get people's attention? You see, Jesus did many miracles, but it was never to point fingers at himself. It was always to point to the glory of God. You can trust him. I believe this. Every occurrence Jesus encountered was seen as a need where the glory of God could be revealed. I also believe that every circumstance we face in life is also the same opportunity to face those circumstances knowing that we have a God who loves us that can take care of us and it's an opportunity for all people to see the glory of God. I mean, he was always caring for people. Lame people could walk. 
deaf people could hear. Demon-possessed people could be set free. Remember old Legion? Come running out of the tombs. He spoke to the demons inside that man and said, you're going to have to get out of here. They said, can we go to the pigs? And the demons were cast out of that, that man and went in those and could not even tolerate what that man had had to tolerate. Don't tell me what God can't do. He always cared. You remember that he went to synagogue that day and a man had a withered hand? And he looked over and he saw the Pharisees and they were looking at him and they were like, is he going to do it? At this point, they knew he could. They, they saw that he had done it, but they're like, is he going to do it today? Jesus didn't care. He went over to the healed the man with a withered hand. And instead of giving praise and glory to God, instead of joining in the angels singing in heaven, instead of joining with all the people that are in glory today, that are in the presence of God, who rightfully give him honor and praise, they got mad at him because he did it on the Sabbath day. How dare he? There's all the other days of the week. If they want to get healed, come on those. Jesus just saw somebody in need and cared for him. What about the blind man who said, Son of David, have mercy on me. And he brought, Jesus says, bring him here. And he looked at the blind man and he said these words. What would you have me do for you? Come on, isn't it obvious? If you're a blind person and you're coming to the Lord, what are you going to want him to do? But Jesus made him say it. In the next few moments, I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit because I think the Holy Spirit may be talking to some people saying this. What do you want me to do for you? Maybe you're thinking about all the times that from the time you were just a small child, you, you knew of the presence of God and the power of God and the love of God. Maybe you didn't feel worthy. Maybe you didn't understand it fully. But maybe God who loves you so much to know every hair on your head, who knows everything that's going on in your life, maybe he wants to look at you and say, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What would you have me do for you? Oh, that man was given his sight. Jesus said, don't say anything to anybody. That didn't work. What about the woman with the issue of blood? She, she, she was so weak for 12 years, she'd been going to doctors, and she, she, I believe she just crawled because she had no strength. And the crowd was there. And, and what was it she said? If I can just touch the hem of his garment. And she didn't even ask permission. And she just touched the heels of his garment. And she was healed. And Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? The disciple said, what do you mean who touched you? All these people. Are, no, no, no. I felt power leave me. Who touched me? She stepped up, stepped up and said, it was me. Don't you know she looked so much better? Now she's standing up and she's got strength. Listen to Jesus' words. Your faith has healed you. God was always there. But you were crying out for him and he met your need. What about the man with the sick of the palsy who had four friends toting him on the mat? And they took him to the house where Jesus was, Mark chapter 2. And they get there get in by all the people so they go up on the roof and they kick a hole in the roof and they lower the man down and Jesus is just looking up and don't you know he's smiling at them because the Bible says that Jesus when Jesus saw their faith not the man's faith when Jesus saw the faith of the ones who brought him he knew the man was going to be healed and he healed him for all to see what about when the ten lepers came all ten all diseased, all different circumstances and play, positions in life. But Tim come, Tim come to him, and Jesus said, you just go. And as they left, listen, as they left, they were healed. You know, we remember that story because the Bible says that nine of them, when they found out that they were healed, they just went on celebrating. But one of them came back to give glory and praise to, to Christ. The other nine probably said, hey, let's go to the lake. 
Hey, let's go home with our family and celebrate. But one said, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. If he did it for one, he can do it for ten. What about when the 5,000 were there and were hungry? Jesus looked at his disciples and said, why don't you give them something to eat? Oh, Lord, it'd take, we don't have a grocery store in here. It'd take all, the, it'd take all this much money. Oh, we can't do it. You do it. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. No, we can't do it. Send them away. Send them home. Just bring me what you got. A little boy with a sack lunch. And Jesus fed everybody fish po' boys. Amen. And everybody got their fill, and it was good, and God takes care. It doesn't matter if it's one. It doesn't matter if it's ten. It doesn't matter if it's 5,000 men as well as women and children. He didn't do it just once. He did it twice. He did it for 4,000 men later on. Don't tell me what my God can't do. Do you think anybody that day, do you think about those disciples who watched God bless it and break it and give it away? Wasn't their heart going like this? Weren't they praising God for who he is and what he can do? What about when they were in the boat and they thought they were going to sink? They came up and said, don't you care? We're about to go under. Don't you care? You're sleeping. And he woke up and said, peace, be still. And they thought they were afraid of the winds and the waves, but they had even greater fear for the one who was stronger than the winds and the waves. What about when Jesus sent him out on the boat again at another time? And, and in the middle of the night, when the winds were blowing, he came walking in peace out on the water. Isn't it amazing to you that when they saw Jesus walking on the water, instead of praising God and saying, victory in Jesus, our, our salvation is here, they, 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 all their faith just went out the window. And they said, it's a ghost. They just lost their theology like that. Jesus said, fear not, it's me. By the way, Peter understood something. It's okay to know God can. Listen to me now. But I need to join in on it. I got to be a part of this too. And that's exactly what he did. He didn't just believe it in his head. What about when the, the, he was preaching there and they were in the boat and those guys had been fishing all the night? And, and what was it? They call it what? Nothing? Say it again. You ever labored and toiled and done all, all you could and just absolutely you're, you're empty? Jesus says, let's go fishing. And what happened when they threw down the net? Mm. A little help. Mm. Filled that boat up. What about when old Peter, he was running his mouth again, talking to some people. They were asking Peter some questions. So Jesus said, this tax, said, who's supposed to pay that tax? Us or the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles. Well, because you opened your mouth, Peter, go down there to the lake and throw in a hook. You're going to catch a fish, and there'll be a gold Drop me in its mouth. Wonder what Peter was thinking. What would you be thinking? Go down the lake, take a string with a hook on it. I don't know if it had bait on it or not. Just throw it in. You're going to catch a fish. And by the way, when you catch the fish, open up the mouth, there'll be a gold coin in there. How many of you be going? Right. Sure. Uh, would you say that that would be a miracle? Would you say that would be bigger than you? But praise God, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter, took a line with a hook, threw it in the water, and I wonder what it was like when he went, hmm? And he pulled it in, and then now his heart's doing this, right? And he reaches down there and grabs that fish and opens up its mouth, and he looks in, now his heart's going, pulls out that gold corn, exactly like God said, hey, go pay the tax. Go pay the tax now. What about on Palm Sunday when he said, go and you'll find a, the pony? And it was exactly the way he said. What about when it was time to take the Passover that last week? And he said, oh, find a man with a jar of water. Follow him and he'll take him and tell him that the master has, needs a, 
your room. And it was exactly like he said. What about when Jesus told them again and again and again, I must go and I will be crucified and they will bury me. But three days later, I will be raised again. Did they believe him? What about the leader in the synagogue who came to Jesus and said, my daughter is at the point of death. Jesus says, I'll go with you. But then word came to him. It's okay, she's already dead. Don't bother the master anymore. Jesus said what? Only believe. They went on to the house. The funeral services had kind of begun. The mourners were there. Jesus went and touched her. Little girl, arise. She stood up. I wonder what Jairus thought. I wonder what he felt when he heard the, the mourning. But I wonder what he felt like when his daughter came and hugged his neck. What about the woman of Nain? Her husband had died. And now her child had died. And they were having the funeral service. And the men were carrying the casket down the street. And Jesus came up and stopped the funeral service. And put his hand, a powerful right hand, upon that casket. And the man who was dead sat up. What about when he went to the tomb of the one who had been dead four days? His friend. And he said those words, Lazarus, come forth. And the one who didn't have life, the author of life, gave him life afresh and new again. Instead of believing that, you know what happened? They not only wanted to kill Jesus, now they wanted to kill Lazarus too because he was the proof of it. They heard, but yet would not believe. Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle to point people to a loving God who could provide, who would take care of them. But yet, all they would do is see through their own lens because salvation is not a matter of the head. Salvation is a matter of the heart. We are saved by grace through faith. You can't get away from that. You cannot get a person to heaven simply by teaching him the precepts and principles of the book. We have a lot of people who have this in their head, but they're not living it in their heart. There's a lot of people who read this to learn more about him, but they don't stop and see the God that is alive and want to join him in the Word and say, Lord, you're a mighty God. Be mighty God for me. Lord, you can provide. Provide for me. Lord, I will praise you. I will praise you. Some people just say, well, I don't know. My circumstances look pretty bad. I don't know why God would let this. I've been good. I don't know why God would let me walk through this. They get mad at God. Or how many times somebody will, something will happen and they'll say, okay, God, if you'll get me out of this, I promise I'll do A, B, and C. As if God needs to be prodded or provoked to do something kind. That God wouldn't love you and take care of you. That somehow he's got to kind of get some quid pro quo from you. You've got to do something before God. Is that the kind of God that we serve? Or do we serve a loving God who just cares? Who will be there for us? Who will protect, about it, protect us? But a circumstance will come up in our life and we'll forget about the power and the glory of God. Can I just say this? How little does Satan have to do to make you doubt God his provision. How little does he have to do to get you off your game of trusting and believing? 
I don't think he has to do a lot sometimes. Sometimes I think he has to do just a little few things. We try to go to God and boss him and tell him what to do. Lord, you better do this, and if you don't do it, I'm mad at you. I won't come to church. I won't do whatever. Instead of just loving him and trusting him and following him and serving him and saying, I will follow you wherever you lead me. I will die daily for you. What we need is to accept him with a childlike faith. I didn't say a childish faith. We need to grow up. But a childlike faith. Just see, believe him, praise him. If it's a good day, praise the Lord. If it's a bad day, praise the Lord. If you feel good, give him glory. If you feel like the world's falling apart, give him glory. I promise you, when we get to heaven, we'll understand it better. We'll know what God is doing. He's never made a mistake. He's never late. He always does that which is best. He always gives us that which is right. Sometimes we blame God. Sometimes we come to him and tempt him saying, if you're God, do this. Rather than just saying, because you're God, I love you. I praise you. And I thank you. You know what he said to Satan? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He probably looked at old Satan and said, you should read more of Psalms 91. It's mighty good. And that's exactly what I'm going to do to those people. I'm going to take care of them. And by the way, Satan, you will be under my foot. I'd rather be on the blessed side, wouldn't you? I said earlier, from your earliest memories, you've seen the hand of God. What else does God have to do to let you know that he loves you?